Thank you all so much for joining us today. As Jen said, I'm Carl Gableson, I'm the EAP coordinator, and I'm also the adjunct professor of US-Japan relations, and so today I'll be focusing a little bit more on that second role. Um, so what I want to talk about today is the role of Japan content within a global education offered in Japan. Um, to put it simply, the question I'm trying to address is, how can I teach Japanese students about Japan in a way that meets the goals of global education. So, to start, I want to do a little bit of defining what is global education. And in fact, there's kind of two perspectives on this. And particularly being an American school in Japan, we're kind of working to strike a balance between following this American definition in order to meet with our accreditation standards and prepare our students for America, but also the Japanese definition in order to prepare our students for the Japanese workforce. So let me get into those a little bit first. If we talk about the Japanese perspective on global education, uh, the Ministry of Education has um, what, what they call the global jinzai, or global human resources, set as their goal for a global education. And they have three points that that focuses on. The first is language and communication skills. The second is a series of kind of personality traits that are a little bit ill-defined and kind of hard to quantify, things like being self-directed, having a sense of mission, being responsible. And then the third is understanding other cultures and maintaining Japanese identity. And this third one is the one that kind of causes some issues when we combine it with the American view. So I'll be focusing most on this third view today. Um, from the American side, um, if we go to the, the National Education Association, the NEA is America's largest organization of over three million educators from all levels. And their official definition of global education is for building global competence. And they look for four qualities to show that someone has global competence. The first is international awareness. This includes knowledge of other cultures, knowledge of world history, knowledge of international relations. The second is appreciation of diversity, um, tolerance for other ethnic and religious groups, um, and foreign language proficiency, and competitive global work skills, things like critical thinking, innovation. Um, so again, I'm going to be focusing on these first two, the international awareness and appreciation of diversity. Um, now, some of you who are aware of the situation of global education in Japan may already see this coming, but there are certain compatibility issues when we try to combine these two approaches. Um, if we go to lots of international scholars' work on um, international or global or multicultural education in Japan. Um, most of the literature would suggest that the education here is very, very focused on building a, sa a sense of Japanese uniqueness, a sense of uh, almost a nationalistic, almost superior even, or eth ethnocentric, uh, or at least essentialist view of Japan, focusing on multicultural education as a way of highlighting difference rather than as creating skills to build cooperation. Um, so, to put that simply, what that means is that, according to the kind of international scholarly perspective, studying Japan in Japan means that maintaining Japanese identity supersedes the appreciation of diversity. Um, from the other side, um, as you may have seen from lots of recent news about um, the Prime Minister's policies for education, particularly related to history education, um, there's a strong sense that the international view of history on issues like the Nanjing Massacre, the Comfort Women, um, the Manchurian Incident, that um, that's seen as being too dark, as having a negative impact on Japanese students' sense of self, sense of national identity. Um, so it's seen as something that's going to damage them, and therefore this sense of international awareness that's supposed to come from an American or international education is going to end up having a damaging effect on Japanese identity. Um, now, speaking personally, when I first read this news, I thought, oh, that's ridiculous. What are they talking about? Um, but from my own experience of working with students, I've had students come to me with stories like, um, a good example is a student who told me that when he was studying in America, the topic of whaling came up in a class. And even though he'd never eaten whale, he'd never even thought about whaling, and he didn't really know anything about it, the negative attitude of the other students suddenly forced him into a defensive position and he found himself 
like kind of almost spouting nationalist rhetoric in an attempt to kind of defend his country and his sense of self. Um, so I don't think we should completely discount this perspective. And so um, my goal for today is to talk about how I have attempted to kind of balance these two perspectives through my course. Um, so let me start by talking a little bit about my course. My course is called U.S.-Japan Relations. It's very interdisciplinary. It's not only a political science course. We talk about art, we talk about business, we talk about a lot of history. Um, but it's U.S. accredited. It's through our home campus's course catalog, so it has to meet certain American standards. It's done in English, so that affects the reading materials. So in general, that means it's coming more from the international slash American side than from the Japanese side. Um, another interesting um, note that makes the class a little bit more complex is that our student body is very diverse. So at any given time, I may have Chinese, Korean, Russian, or half Japanese students in the class. This semester, I think half of my class is half Japanese, one half British, half Filipino, etc. Um, and I only have one student who is only Japanese. So it's quite a, co a complex group this semester, and that's giving me a little bit more juggling to deal with in terms of balancing these perspectives. Um, but we include a lot of the topics that are considered to be dark from the uh, Japanese government's perspective. We talk about the, uh, the Nanjing massacre, we talk about the comfort women, we also talk about the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, about the internment camps for Japanese Americans, because I don't want to focus on just one side if I'm focusing on the whole relationship. Um, so perhaps you can imagine it's not an easy course to find this kind of balance between protecting identity and also giving the international view of history and events and building this awareness of diversity. Um, so I've got three strategies that I've tried to incorporate into the course, and I will define those strategies for you and then give you a sampling of my results. Um, so the first strategy is respectful discussion. Um, this is something that I build into my course syllabus and go over from the first day. And not just to say we need to be respectful, but to actually talk about what that means, to talk about how to do it, and to give students um, avenues for communication. If they're not sure how to say something sensitive in a respectful way, they can talk to me about it. If they feel they've been respectful, or they've been disrespected, disrespected, then they have several channels with which to communicate with me, and we can address that, and we can make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, so I focus on this very hard from the beginning. Um, and another part of it is that I have a no generalizations policy. Um, that I'm trying to really instill in them that no, there is no black and white situation. Everything is more complex. And so from the first day, I make it very clear that we will never say Japanese people are, or American people are. That we always have to acknowledge that there's some room for variation. Um, and we also talk about how to include the, the extra language, how to include that many Japanese people are, or in my experience, some Japanese people are, how to add those little qualifiers to make it more open and respectful. Um, and when I do get into the, the quote-unquote dark content, um, to show that I'm trying to be respectful too, I always start with a disclaimer. I tell them, this is all very dark, this is all very heavy, we're going to read some rather graphic material, but my goal is not to make you hate Japan or to hate America. Um, I have a deep respect for both countries, and that's what I want to instill in you. But in order to respect them, we have to understand them. So I try to emphasize this so that no student ever feels that their culture or their country is being targeted. Um, so this is my first strategy. My second strategy is to cover all sides of the contested issues. This has been the most difficult for me because it means I've had to do a little research into views that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, but I feel that it's important to present both sides and to make the students feel as though they're the ones who are choosing which one they're supporting. Um, but I want to give them all of the information they need before that happens. And so I start by talking about which of the sides is generally more prominent internationally, and talking about who are the stakeholders, who supports this side, and why might they support this side, what benefits are they getting from supporting this side, and doing that with both sides, without indicating any judgment on my part. Um, I also make it very clear that when we talk about, for example, if we talk about the comfort women, um, which parts of this issue specifically are contested, and which parts are accepted by both sides. 
so that they don't just have this image that the whole thing is, is a yes or no situation. Um, and then, in the end, I leave it up to them. I don't try to force an opinion on them, but I try to arm them to come up with their own opinion. Um, fortunately, they often come to the conclusion that I agree with, but I try not to indicate that. Um, what I do is I try to encourage them to make their own choices with the knowledge that no matter which side they choose, there's going to be no judgment or repercussions for me. It's not going to affect their grade as long as they can logically or factually support their side. Um, the third strategy that I use is developing a theoretical framework for critical analysis. Um, I think being able to critically examine your culture and another culture um, is important both for understanding and for being respectful. Right? It avoids generalizations and it helps us to find problems even in our own cultures and with our own arguments or our own common sense. So I focus on three points in my course. The first is Orientalism, right? kind of the sense of how Asia is perceived by the West and what kind of stereotypes or common sense Westerners and Americans often have about Japan. Then I focus on Nihon Jinron, the theories of Japanese uniqueness, the kind of sense of Japanese essentialism. And we talk about where these theories come from and how they're, they're propagated both among Japanese people in Japan and in some cases among Americans thinking about Japan. Um, and then we talk about nationalism, what it means, how it works, how it's spread, and what effects it has on the people of both countries. Um, so I bring these in very, very early, and then I have a whole series of assignments kind of trying to test their knowledge, make sure that they understand these. I supply as many examples as I can, and then I ask them for definitions, and I ask them for examples. Um, I do this through online work, sometimes through in-class presentations, and through questions on the tests. Um, because it's very important for me to make sure, first, that they understand what these complex theoretical terms mean, but second, that they can then use them and identify them themselves. So one of my key objectives by the end of the course is that the students should be coming to me and saying, oh, I saw this movie, it was so Orientalist, or I was reading the newspaper yesterday and this politician said something, and don't you think it's a Nikon Jinro? Um, so I'm trying to build this so that, um, ideally, both Americans and Japanese can look at both sides and identify when they're really looking at a culture and when they're looking at a projection of a culture. Um, so. Let's talk then about how effective my strategies have been. Um, in order to test the efficacy, I did a series of surveys, interviews, and also examinations of student test questions, things like definitions or other assignments about give me an example of Orientalism or um, looking at their knowledge of the comfort women issue or these kinds of historical <coughs> facts. Um, last semester in my class, I did three surveys one at the very beginning of the class, before I'd taught anything, one just after we'd finished World War II history, right in the center of the class, and then one just at the end before the final exam. Um, and one of the things that I focused on was asking them, how proud are you of your nationality? Uh, because I wanted to address this issue of, are we protecting a sense of Japanese identity? Um, I also surveyed um, about, I contacted about 30 alumni who have taken the course and have since left the college. Over half of them are abroad somewhere. Most are in America or Canada, some are in the UK. One is in Estonia, surprisingly. And a few are here in Japan. Um, but I contacted them with similar questions about what they retained from the course, about how it had or had not been useful to them, and specifically um, kind of open-ended questions about what knowledge was useful or what do you still remember. Um, well, as long as the same question about pride in their nationality. Um, so pulling all of this together, if I can go back to my um, bullet points from the NEA and from the Ministry of Education. If we look first at the, the NEA's goals, international awareness and appreciation of diversity, um, test results and student assignments suggest that the students have developed a fairly strong understanding of the controversial aspects of history. Um, that they can tell you what were some of considered to be the theories behind why the Nanjing Massacre happened, or who are the different sides debating the comfort women issue, and why is it, uh, why are they choosing those sides. Um, but interestingly, something that came completely unsolicited from several students, both in the class and among alumni, 
was that they said that they felt much more comfortable discussing war history with Chinese, Koreans, Americans, and other East Asians. Um, that they said that they worried before taking my class that if some Chinese student or Chinese friend asked them about it, they'd be kind of unprepared to debate it, and they'd either embarrass themselves or just not be able to say anything. And so they told me that they felt that this was um, a very positive step for them, that they felt they could be confident in these kind of situations and represent their own history accurately. Um, they also, as I said, they, uh, they've come to the point where they can have, where they can accurately recognize, identify Nihon Jinran and Orientalism, ethnocentrism, nationalism, and they can use that to have a deeper critical analysis of media, of politics, coming from both countries, um, which helps them to identify and avoid stereotypical thinking. Um, and finally, the uh, rule of avoiding generalizations, along with some of the course content and even the content of the, 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 or the population of the students in the class, has done wonders for encouraging them to feel more aware of uh, the diversity of bo in both the US and Japan. Um, one thing that several of my students indicated in their survey surveys was they felt that one result of the class was that their definition of the meaning of Japanese had changed, had become more nuanced or more complex. Um, okay, if I approach the other uh, set of goals, if we talk about the Ministry of Education's goals about protecting Japanese identity, um, looking at my students from this past semester, the average score of how proud they were of their nationality on a scale of 1 to 5 was 4, 3.9 after World War II history, and then 4 again at the end. So no real dramatic change here, despite getting into the very, the quote-unquote dark stuff. Um, and if we look at how many students chose these, these higher levels, four, so 4 points or 5 points on the scale for how proud they are, that actually went up by the end of the semester. So measuring it that way, we could say that in some cases, we'd even made students more proud. Um, only one student answered um, negative to or answered negatively to the question of how their feelings had changed, whereas five answered positively. Interestingly, the student who said that she felt that her feelings had become more negative chose five 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 for her score for the three surveys. Um, among the alumni, it was almost exactly the same numbers. In fact, slightly higher, 4.3 out of 5 was the average, and 81%, again, chose a 4 or a 5. Um, and another thing that came unsolicited from the alumni was that many of them felt much more comfortable um, talking about Japan while abroad. I have the case of one student, she's studying um, in a rural area in New Mexico. And she said that she's probably the only Japanese person for miles and miles around. And so for many of the people that she meets and interacts with, she's the first Japanese person they've ever talked to. And she said that she was very glad to have this grounding in history and culture, but also this understanding of how Americans from that background might be perceiving her, perceiving her culture. And she said it's been incredibly helpful in how she's built her interactions and how she's represented her country. Um, so. If I may conclude, I feel that my results have generally been quite positive. Um, I'd say first, at least in the case of my class, it's been possible to teach this dark history without causing any real damage to a sense of national pride or national identity. Um, second, um, the students have learned not learned to identify Orientalism, Nihon Jinran, nationalism, not only in order to look at it in terms of how what is happening in the media or what is happening in politics, but also to re-examine and evaluate their own perspectives and to look at their own culture more critically. Um, so that often they tell me that now they feel that they understand their country more deeply and that allows them to be proud in a way that's not just a blind reaction, but proud with really something behind it. Um, and finally, questioning generalizations, both through my in-class rule and through coursework and assignments, um, has allowed all of them to, at least through their uh, responses, to indicate that they have a much deeper understanding of diversity, and so hopefully this has built more tolerance. Um, okay, so thank you very much.